Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Thank you for tuning into the Lone Wolf Podcast. I have a special guest here today, Eric Jackman, the host of Jackman Radio. Uh, I found him uh, through a friend of mine, Reed Coverdale. He's had him on this show before. Uh, Reed's a great guy. Uh, if you haven't seen Reed, check out The Naturalist Capitalist. But I've watched their videos together. Uh, uh, I got to say, Eric does some great Donald Trump impressions as well. Uh, but but, but he, he seems like a very well-informed guy. I wanted to bring him on the show, kind of pick his brain a little bit of uh, what got him into politics. And then we're just going to kind of flee for, uh, you know, flow back and forth from there. So, Eric, uh, how are you doing today, man? And uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm doing great, man. Uh, thanks for inviting me on. And yeah, Reed has just been crushing the game, man. I, I call him base truck driver. You know, his his life is to drive truck and promote liberty, you know, and uh, he's doing awesome with that. So, yeah, like you said, we, we do kind of a once a month special uh, Avengers initiative where we join forces at Ryan Dawson. We call it the Four Horsemen. Yeah. And we have on a, a fourth guest and we got a big one coming up on Sunday, May 16th with the great Dave Smith. So that'll be fun. But yeah, so I host a uh, podcast with my twin brother, Mike, called Jackman Radio. We're in New Hampshire, the live free or die state, which is probably one of the most libertarian states in our country, I'd argue. And we have a, a history of having an independent streak over here. So my, um, my foray into politics goes back to really eighth grade. We went on what's called American Heritage Tour. Um, and you're you know, I, live, I grew up in small town, New Hampshire, and you're taken to New York City, um, uh, Washington, D.C., all the Civil War battle sites. And it's like an immersive week long trip you do with the school and they bring you to all the monuments, um, museums. And on that trip, it's funny enough, we were in D.C. and George W. Bush was president and he was out cruising around in town for whatever reason, maybe to go get cocaine or something. I don't know. But um <laughs> he uh they, they he waved he waved uh, you know i happened to be on the street seeing bush go by and i was like oh you know i was you know eighth grade kid i was like holy shit that's pretty cool that was the president so that really kind of made me interested in this idea that you know you got these politicians and people in power who are these personalities and uh they're all very interesting people and to be able to be that close to someone was cool and it kind of really made me realize and recognize how cool the new hampshire primary is up here in new hampshire where every four years, really, it seems like every friggin' six, six to eight months, these people are here running for president, where the politicians and big name and nationally known famous people come through our small state and beg for our votes, bribe us for our votes, you know, do whatever they can to get our support and get us on board. So that was like my first uh, experience with it. And then that got me into high school. And when I was like a junior, the 2004 primary was ramping up. That was the one with Howard Dean, John Kerry, John Edwards. And um, I'm originally from Massachusetts. So I kind of remembered John Kerry a little bit. And, you know, I had, this is my 17, 18 year old brain. I didn't know. I didn't know anything. So I decided I was going to support John Kerry. And my brother and I, through volunteering and meeting him at events, got him to come to our high school. And he came to our high school in a helicopter and landed in the parking lot. Um, to come and speak to our gym gymnasium full of the whole school and everyone's like oh wow the Jackman brothers set that up what a cool event and then afterwards we we had a little handheld camera we got to ask him a question and film it and and have that so at that point man I was like I love this world I want to be in on this I, I don't know in what form whether it's running for office or interviewing people or being on campaigns but I just I loved it I thought it was so cool and, uh, you know, at that time, I considered myself just a, a mainstream Democrat. I, I thought George W. Bush was the devil. John Kerry was something different. He was going to save us from, from the Bush, Cheney, uh, you know, demons. And um, I really believe that there was a difference. And, of course, we know there's no difference. They are distant cousins. They're both skull and bones. Uh, you know, all this stuff. You don't know this stuff when you're 18 years old. You don't know what the Federal Reserve right. is. You, you know, they're, they're not teaching us this stuff in public schools. So really like my, um, my transformation into being, becoming a liberty minded person happened in college. So, you know, a lot of people go to college. It's like, you could become more liberal 
and you become more more of like <laughs> more of a progressive for everything. And it's not to say I don't have some progressive views. I do. I do still consider myself a pretty progressive person. But big picture um, items and policies and, and things to consider and think about. I didn't really become aware of until like 06, 07, when I started seeing all these signs with a guy's name, Ron Paul, here in New Hampshire. And I was like, Ron Paul, who, who is that? Because one banner was just like, who is Ron Paul? <laughs> and, and, you know, you're, you're a 19-year-old, you know, partying college kid. You know, I'd always been really anti-war. My brother and I were known in the area. We were, we were 15, 16 years old leading up to the Iraq war. We were loud about opposing the war. And, yeah. and we had adults all around us. Most of them were, were pro Iraq war. We have to go in there. We got to do that. So I always had that. I always had that feeling and that inclination to oppose war. So once I caught wind of Ron Paul, man, and, and I, I went back and I could look at all these speeches, this, this, this kind of, kind of adorable grandfatherly figure with ill-fitted suits screaming about, you know, empire and how we, we kill all these people around the world and we create terrorists. And, and then to see him go on the debate stage with Giuliani and give him a complete dressing down about foreign <laughs> policy and saying, it's called blowback. It's blowback. We've been bombing their countries for decades. We've been sanctioning them. We've killed them. We've starved them. And that's what happened on 9-11. And then, you know, you got Giuliani going, that, that's incredible. I've heard some crazy things about 9-11. But I've never heard anything as crazy as what Mr. Paul is saying. But it wasn't crazy what, what Ron Paul was saying. It was right on the fucking money. Right. So Ron Paul was my gateway, man. Yeah. I was in college. Um, so I, I actually found Ron Paul uh, when, when I was fairly young as well. But the two people that I would say kind of got me interested, Ron Paul was one. The other was Jesse Ventura. Oh, hell yeah. Hell so yeah. I, I found Jesse Ventura. So I, I grew up a fan of... Uh, of professional wrestling and i still watch it to a degree today i just don't think it's as good as it used to be but i knew who jesse the body ventura was and i started hearing about this wrestler who was in politics and i'm like okay let's, so i'll check him out a little i started listening to some of his clips on uh when he would go on like piers morgan because you know he was blacklisted he actually got an msnbc contract of course uh he spoke out against going to war in Iraq and they basically put him on the shelf but kept him contracted so he couldn't make appearances elsewhere. They bought my silence, Charles. <laughs> they bought my silence. So uh, after they made him uh, forcefully be quiet, you know, he started finally making the rounds and I listened to a lot of what he said and he had a very catchy way of describing a lot of things. I loved how he would talk about George Bush and Dick Cheney just like you uh, I, I thought George Bush was a, a bumbling idiot and Dick Cheney. I, I think kind of in a lot of ways to me, I look at Bush and Cheney like I kind of look like uh, toward Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. Like the vice president's the one that's really behind the, uh, the scenes pulling all the strings here. The guy up front's half cracked and stupid and doesn't really know what he's doing. And, and I think, I'll be honest, I think George Bush was a little smarter. I don't think he had a lot of the mental issues we're seeing out of Biden at the time, but I think he just played the role of the idiot. But I do think Dick Cheney definitely was the conniving mind of the two personally. I don't know. It's just, I, I think of all three Bushes, Daddy Bush probably had the the, the best brain. They, the sons, I don't know what happened there, but they well, just kind of strike me as they got whatever was left over. On it. Daddy Bush is lifetime CIA. This guy right. was director of the CIA going back to after World War II when he became a pretty big uh, businessman in the energy world with um, Dresser right. Industries. He always had commercial cover, but he was working for the CIA. Let's, let's call a spade a spade here, man. Right. People will deny that. He always denied it. But I live down near the CIA, the fucking building's name after him. You know, they're just they're, they're going to name they're going to name the building after just some some guy because they like him, you know. Right. But uh, oh, yeah, no, the sons. I mean, Jeb was really the one groomed who was supposed to be the president before W. And right. I don't know if that was W kind of saying, I got to show my dad that I got the bona fides in the chop to be president. Don't, it's not going to be <laughs> Jeb. It's going to be me. And um, I think you're right, too, that George W. Bush is not an idiot. He's not stupid. And he, those people are brilliant. They're, 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 they're actors. The Bush right. family are actors. You know, really what they represent is they represent, they represent a cartel that is a nexus of intelligence, Wall Street, money laundering, drug trafficking, and terrorism. I mean, they're, they're fucking best friends with the Bushes and the Carlisle group, uh, the Bin Ladens and the Carlisle group and the Saudis, uh, oil, energy. I mean, they're, they're, all, they're all up into that, neck yeah. deep. Yeah. So they had this brilliant ability to you know, 
promote in front W. Bush as this folksy Texas governor who's got, I got my boots on, I'm clearing brush at Crawford. I'm doing the hard work, Charles. It's, it's hard work and it's very hard work. And we were attacked by a faceless evil. And pretty soon the people that knocked down these buildings are going to hear you too. And <laughs> he's brilliant. I mean, he was a cheerleader at Andover Academy at a prep, prep school. George W. Bush was a cheerleader. I remind people of that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and Jeb, Jeb's, uh, Jeb's very low energy. We know that. We know that he's a low, he's totally low energy. He's a loser. He's a lightweight. Okay. And um, yeah, the, the Bushes are just, they're, they're a cartel. I call the Clinton cartel and the Bush mafia, you know, and yeah. they have their interests that they've always represented and they have their media partners and their media allies who sanitize the fact that these people are psychopaths and killers and murderers and warmongers and drug dealers and money launderers. Um, so <laughs> libertarianism is a good gateway into understanding that world um, and recognizing that there really isn't a lick of difference between Democrat and Republican. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And, and one thing that, that I will say is, you know, um, I, I've been an independent for some time. Like, like I said, obviously, you know, my, my two influences, Ventura and Paul. And the only Hell time yeah. I, I voted Republican uh, once, I would have twice if I could have when Paul was running for office. But I voted, I, I, I made a decision in 2016 because some of the things I heard Trump saying, he sounded like he was going to be an outsider. And I looked at it like this. I said, okay, you know, um, maybe he will be, maybe he won't be, but I know what I'm going to get with a Clinton. So I took that gamble and I voted on Trump and I wasn't satisfied with the results. I, I applauded the way Trump did certain things. For, for example, um, I, I will say this. He didn't start necessarily another war, but he didn't really fulfill any promises of ending any either. So, I mean, there, there, there were things, but I would say overall, the bad kind of outweighed the good. So I wound up completely going third party. But me, me personally, if I had to go with one party or another, uh, and I'm going to just kind of pick your brain on this, I would have to probably go with the Libertarian Party, but I, I maintain myself as an independent. Uh, just because I, I look at it like this. I think it, even if we got rid of the two-party system that we have right now with Democrats and Republicans, and, and it's like you said, they're, they're kind of joined at the hip. The Democrats are going to make sure no outsider like a Tulsi Gabbard or anyone ever got to the forefront of that party. Uh, they made sure it was Joe Biden. But on the flip side, the Republicans, I mean, I, I, I don't know how for sure I could speculate why Trump made it, but now that he's gone, you've already heard the rumblings about Liz Cheney, right? So they, they want to pull things back in that direction. That's what I tell a lot of people. Like the problem with the two parties with this takeover and, and, and you know, take them over and destroy them from the inside and make them like your version of a third party. They've got such a power hold and the corruption is so strong. They're not just going to allow you to do that. That's why Ron Paul wasn't successful. It's why people like Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, even though I think Bernie Sanders was a cuck, he most certainly didn't get it. Okay. So they're, they're going to make sure they keep the power. And so if I had to go with one, I would go with the libertarian party, but personally, I kind of have a feeling like George Washington. And that is, I don't know that we should just have political parties in general. Anyway, if we could ever reach that point, I think once you have a party that kind of opens the door where it's like a football team, basically. Mm -hmm. I've got to stick by my team rather than just voting on what I believe to be the best thing for the country or for my constituents or whatever, you know, and, and Washington warned us that parties would lead to this sort of back and forth war where someone would want the ultimate power. And it's about, Oh, are we going to win the election for our party at that point? And you're putting party before the country. That, that's kind of my take, but how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm with you on that, man. Well, like our friend, the good governor, Jesse the Body, says they're like gangs, Charles. Yeah. It's it's Democrips and Rebloodligans. <laughs> and the gang, the gang takes precedence over everything else, raising money, promoting right. the gang, having the blue and red colors. So they are like gangs, man. And you're absolutely right. Ron Paul got the shaft in 08 and 12. And um, my good friend, Tulsi Gabbard, who I worked for for a year here in New Hampshire, she was treated the... Uh, she was radioactive to the Democratic Party 
Um, yeah. But th this this cross section of people, this coalition that formed around her was incredible. Very similar to what formed around Ron Paul up here in New Hampshire in 2012 when we got 23 percent of the vote. We came in second to Mitt Romney. But I'm with you. Um, I identify as an independent as well. I don't really, you know, I don't like parties. Um, you know, I, I agree with some things the Green Party stands for. You know, there's, right. I, I, so I have hung out with Jesse Ventura. He's been on my show a couple times. Um, I've had Jill Stein on my show. I got to go and hang out at her house down in Massachusetts for a few hours, and my brother and I interviewed her. And she's a sharp woman. And a lot of the Green Party platform is amazing. It would be amazing policy for our country and for the world. Um, but these two parties have done a brilliant job of painting third parties in such a way that they're a joke, that they're just propped up by the Russians, that uh, they can never win, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. And for a lot of, for a long time, a lot of people did believe that bullshit and that rhetoric. But in my view, Trump did a hostile takeover in a boardroom of the GOP. He took it over, man, and it's a cult of personality. And he, he molded the, the MAGA thing into his own image. It's, it's built up around him, his family, all these personalities and all the media ecosystems around Trump, like Newsmax, your OAN, Fox News, um, Breitbart, you know, all, all of them. And he, he, I mean, that's what Trump is, man. He's a brand. He's, he's a right. brilliant, brilliant marketer. He's a brilliant performer. And I'm with you, man. There's, there's things I absolutely love about Donald Trump. I love how horrible he treated Jeb Bush and the Clintons. Like to be up on that stage in South Carolina and, uh, you know, Jeb's like, my brother kept America safe. And uh, Trump's like, the World Trade Center came down during your brother's reign. That's not safe. I was like, yes, yes. He's like, the war in Iraq was a disgrace. They lied. They knew there were no weapons, and they lied, okay? It took Jeb Bush five days. Oh, I'm against the war. Oh, it was a good idea. Oh, it was a bad idea. It took him five days till his people told him what to say about the war. And to Trump's credit, man, he was always against the Iraq war. He was on Howard Stern when the war was cooking up, and he said, I, I think it's a terrible idea. If we go in there, we should take the oil, which is totally barbaric and sickening to hear. But that's Trump really revealing the elites and, and what war is to them. War is just a resource grab. War is a money grab. It's a power grab. And the two-party system, uh, whether it's left or right, man, it's the same goddamn snake. It's a snake. Yeah. And it's got, it's, got a, it's got a red tail and a blue tail or a red head and a blue, and a blue, a blue head. Yeah. Okay. And they don't, de they don't really deviate on the big issues, man. And, and the, the, the only people you hear talking about issues that can actually impact and change things and change policy are like libertarians, are Green Party people, or are based mavericks who were part of the GOP or the Democratic Party. So on the right, it would be Ron Paul, Rand Paul to some extent, uh, Justin Amash before he left and became a libertarian, um, Mike Lee a little bit in the Senate. He's good sometimes on some things. Uh, you know, I know Matt Gates is in hot water right now, but sometimes he's based and says good things. Right. And then on, right. on the left, you have people historically like Mike Gravel, who I also got to know during the 08 primary. I actually drove him around the state. I was his driver during his primary campaign. And that was a lot of fun. I learned a lot from that man. Uh, he's, he's a great, he's, he's awesome. Uh, of course, Tulsi, uh, Dennis Kucinich, who I also got to know very well during the 08 primary up here. Uh, Cynthia McKinney, who would become the Green Party nominee in 08. So you do sometimes have these iconoclast figures who they're called gadflies and they're called crazy. But when you hear what they're saying, whether they're on the left and the right, they're critiques of the big picture things like empire, like regime change, nation building, the Federal Reserve, the war on drugs, the surveillance state. They're all consistent and they're all right on the money. Absolutely. So, and, and like you said, everything is done by the elites of their respective parties and the media ecosystems to suppress that voice, to call them crazy and pigeonhole them. Yeah. And, and one thing that I, I'll kind of add to that, and this is this is my opinion. You, you mentioned, you know, that a lot of people were, were dumb enough to, to fall for that argument about the third parties are a joke. And, and the thing is, I think there's potentially more people who are tired of it now. But I still think we've got far too many people who, who aren't willing to just go vote for the third party. I've encountered that multiple times when I've talked about third party, like, well, it, it's, a, it's just a protest vote. You're never going to win anything. And my response is, OK, how happy are you with the Democrats and the Republicans? Because if you think we're doing great, then vote for who you think is going to do best for the country. But if you think things are still getting worse and these two parties that have had power for 150 years 
aren't really fixing the problem, guess what? A third party has no chance to win as long as you sit on your hands or continue to just go vote for the parties that aren't fixing the problem. It's going to take you, me, and a lot of other people who are tired to finally say, you know what? Screw it. I'm just not going to vote for those. Let me try another option over here. And in most cases, that would be the case. I mean, like if you went to, I, I don't know, a, a grocery store. And every time you bought your bag of groceries, you got home and half of it was rotten. Why wouldn't you eventually try another alternative at some point? Like, why do you keep going back to that source? And most people, uh, I think is definitely the mainstream media that uh, that is conditioned people to get to this point. Everyone would eventually common sense, they figure out, okay, no, th this isn't working. There's other options. Let's try the other option. But for some reason, that doesn't take hold in politics. And, and, and I don't really understand why. I, I think about probably the closest we've, we've seen what was arguably maybe like uh, Ross Perot back in 1992. And, and he actually was doing very well to the point, you know, that they argue, why did he drop out and jump back in? Supposedly he was getting like death threats or whatever, right? And so he dropped out and then jumped back in the race. Well, when he dropped out and came back, that's what tanked his numbers. But before that, there were certain polls that actually showed him polling above Clinton and Bush. You know, so, and, and this is something that I tell a lot of people too. If we want any kind of third-party power, the biggest, I guess, legit arguments against it, and I'll, I'm going to get your thoughts on this, but is that the way they rig it against the third parties is how they control the elections at the state level. So you kind of have to have power there to reform that system so that third parties could be more competitive. So the biggest criticism that I would say I, I have of the third parties who are out there right now are they seem to put all their eggs into one basket, at least for the most part, and that's the presidency. The problem I have with that is if you take the presidency and you don't have the House or the Senate, you are a sitting duck. You will be subject to four years of gridlock and you're going to get nothing done. And optics are a lot of things. Mainstream media is going to blame you for not getting anything done. They're going to say you basically are holding the country up because you refuse to sign off on anything that the House and the Senate passes. And they'll either have to override vetoes or whatever. So the mainstream media will be burying you saying that you're a problem. And then you're almost going to probably lose the next election because if people start suffering as a result of this gridlock, which they will do, uh, ask Ventura. The state of Minnesota wanted to put a budget together when they thought he was going to run for re-election that would drastically hurt the state, thinking it would then hurt him until he dropped the ball on him at the last minute. Yeah, so um, I'm not running for re-election. Have fun with that. <laughs> so that that that's the thing is, if you want this kind of reform to happen, I, I, I'm fine at least for the first few election cycles till you can gain some power, not even so much focusing on the presidency. If you take enough of the power away at the state levels and the House and the Senate, you've got a big chunk of power right there. And, and if you've got any kind of split in the House and the Senate where you've taken where they, they have to come to you to get anything done, you've made some serious headway there. You're, you're able to block bad legislation and nothing will pass unless they come and wheel and deal with you. At that point, even the presidency, again, override of vetoes. I mean, I don't know if it'll happen or not, but at, at some point, that, that's, that's the way inside. OK, and so for me, I want to see third parties focus on that a lot more. Otherwise, they're just spit. It's like tires that are stuck in mud. I mean, yeah. what, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's a great point. Um, you know, Dave Smith said this in, when he was on Rogan, and it's pretty right on the money. Um, when you're running for president, you really you're just doing a 50 state tour. You're going on tour and you're a performance artist. You're getting up in front of crowds. You're giving the pitch. You're meeting with people, you're doing media hits. So on that level, we do need someone who's a good spokesperson who can articulate three or four core tenets of the platform of the third party. But you're absolutely right. On the, the local level, if you can get people into the state house, if you can get city councils, if you can get members of Congress, that can bubble up. And like you said, have influence and can have sway 
um, in the discourse and in actually law. Like you will, if you can, if you could get ten or fifteen libertarians into Congress, that that could be a game changer, right? Or right. a couple, a couple in the Senate, and that would really, in my view, change. It could change things in a big way. Now, doing it is another thing. Um, you know, the libertarians, they're, they're, they're great with ballot access. They're, they're on the ballot in all 50 states. They have been, I believe, the last, definitely the last two cycles. Right. Um, the Green Party, they're on enough to get the presidency to get 270 um, electoral votes. So they do have that there. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tip O'Neill, the former Speaker of the House, always said all politics is local. Right. And if you're an independent minded person and you're tired of the way things are going, get in there and run for office, make some waves. And really Absolutely. what's happening too with, you know, channels like read your channel, all these other channels, there's independent uh, organic grassroots media popping up around these issues. Right. And we've always been right on about the issues. It's just been a matter of presenting our ideals and presenting our platform and reaching more people because you know, say what you will about Trump. He did expose how disgusting and rotten and corrupt our media is. There's, there's, yeah. there's no denying that. And he, and he fucking created his own media. He, he, all, all of these media, uh, you know, groups sprung up around Trump, you know, right or wrong. You can argue that, but that was, is what is brilliant about the MAGA thing. He, he, he hijacked the Republican party and, you know, traditional media helped create Trump. They gave him over $5 billion in free press during that 2016 primary. And they helped yeah. create Frankenstein's monster. They got, they, if they want to blame someone, go look in a fucking mirror, you right. know, and, and they, and you can read you know, leaked emails, internal documents, memos from these, the, the main media companies, Trump's a gold mine. Our ratings are through the roof. We can't keep your cameras on them. Don't, don't stop following him. The more outrageous he is, the more coverage we're going to give him. And they fed off each other. They played into each other's hands. And the dude fucking won, which I think he was totally shocked that he won. I've heard Melania was crying. She she did not sign up to be first lady. She didn't <laughs> she didn't sign up for that at all. But I think uh, when you see Trump that night, he's he's shocked. Yeah. He's shocked. He didn't believe he was going to win. I didn't believe he was going to win. I was telling everybody, I'm like, nah. I mean, it's going to be horrible, but crooked. This this is it. That they anointed her. She's going to get the presidency. Um, so when he won, that did prove that someone can throttle the system. And he did it on that level. Now, Trump is a unique monster because he's been a household name for over 40 years. Everyone, he went in with like 110% universal name recognition. So what could we do as, as, as a, the Liberty movement is you got to recruit people who, who are personalities, you know, like we know, we know we're good on policy, but delivering that and putting that out there and pack, packaging it and messaging it in a way that resonates with the people that the policies are going to impact is, is I think we're, we're getting better. We're getting better at that. It's happening. It's, it's slow going, but it's definitely happening. And if you can do that and, and really like show a, a someone who's a nine to five worker, like this is how you're getting fucked. And this is not just one party doing this to you. This is both parties. This is the system that's been in place for the 150 years and it's not working. Right. Here's the alternative. Here's what we're offering. So you know, Reed talk. You know, we all talk a lot about uh, pragmatism versus purity, and, and um, you got to come somewhere in the middle there, man. You can't just start if 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 you're from a liberty perspective, you can't just start screaming at people about roads and legalizing heroin and age of consent and all that stuff. You have to. You got to start somewhere where you can meet meet that person where they're at, and and have a conversation with them, and say, you know, for example, okay. Um, no one likes it when people get killed by the cops, no matter what their race is or their background. We all fucking hate it. We're horrified by it. We want it to stop. Why is it happening? What, what is the root of people being killed by the police? So you ask someone that and you just, you want to get their thoughts, get their take and their perspective, and then come back with, well, cops are enforcing laws. Where do the laws come from? <laughs> How is the law created? Right. Where, what is that process about a law? Who is, who is that law really serving? So that's when you can get someone to be like, okay, now you, you got me, tell me more. So then if you can reach someone that way and be like, we need less laws, we need to get rid of these laws. Uh, you know, tell them about qualified immunity, tell them about the fucking war on drugs. 
tell them about those things because on the left, it's all about race and identity and, 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 and that, and they're right about a lot of that, but it, it goes even deeper than that. It goes even deeper than that. And then on the right, depending on which camp they're in, you know, back to blue worship, law enforcement, boot licking, um, and then don't tread on me, come try and take it. So that's kind of fractured a little bit, but as someone who's a spokesperson of Liberty, you could kind of meet those people in the middle and make your pitch in a well-reasoned uh, articulate way and point out those big picture things of a, a rotten system. The system is rotten. Yeah, left, sure. left, red and blue doing what they're going to do. That that's, that's putting uh, duct, duct tape on a shotgun wound or gauze on a shotgun wound. Right. We're, we're talking about cutting the head off completely and starting over. So we need people who can do that on a local level. I think that's part of the strategy. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And that was, you know, like, like you point out, the libertarians had the ballot access for, for some time now. And what disappointed me in, in the 2020 was when I went out to try and vote. I mean, obviously I got to vote president wise for the libertarian party, uh, Joe Jorgensen, but we had a Senate race that was up. Lindsey Graham was up for reelection. I, I am not a Lindsey Graham fan. I got news for you. I wasn't a Jamie Harrison fan by any means either. Jamie Harrison was literally a, a, a lobbyist, which to me, if the, if there's anything that is part of the problem in politics today, lobbyist is definitely up there. Okay. Um, so I wasn't a fan of his at, at all either. Well, the problem was there was really, I think, only one other option, and it was the nominee of the Constitution Party who going into the election had already dropped out and endorsed Lindsey Graham. But there was no libertarian nominee on that ballot at all. And I'm looking at that and I'm like, missed opportunity, missed opportunity. I mean, it, 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 Senate elections aren't every two years. They're, they're, they're harder to get. Okay. There's less seats there to win. Unlike the house, you've only got a hundred seats there. So every time one comes open, especially in a place like South Carolina, I get it's more red, but guess what? That means it might also be more likely to lean more libertarian as well. Completely missed opportunity. You know, there, there's a lot of South Carolinians who are getting tired of Lindsey Graham, but they're not mm -hmm. so tired of Lindsey Graham that they are willing to go vote for the blue Democrat. OK, they they you know, they, they're still in that right versus left. Like, oh, I can't vote for the guy who, who's representing the snowflakes out there. No, no, no way. I can't do that. You know, we're still too red of a state. But if you got someone who got could talk about any, those bread and butter issues. So what you talked about, what the guy that works the nine to five deals with. And that's something that I've been telling a lot of people is. It was so easy to write off Donald Trump. The mainstream media told us all the reasons why he was bad. And, and, and I'm like you. I think you might have, you know, was, was surprised that he won. And you talked about Melania. I think it even took her a while before she finally moved into the White House. Right. So, yes, that that being said. But the thing is, Trump should have known there was a chance of success there. And, and I think once he got the job, he grew a liking to it. But if you look at kind of how he did things. Ventura said he took a, he took a page right out of my book. And then is that really surprising? Because they were both members of the reform party back in the early two thousands. And when Ventura uh, or, or late nineties, rather, and when, when he pulled it off, Trump came to see him mm -hmm. and took notes because yeah. I, I think it was in the early two thousands when Trump was hinting at doing it another time or something. Right. He was, the, he was flirting party. in 2000 with the reform party. Right. And right. The, the, so yeah, he, he took notes from Ventura's playbook. Mm -hmm. And so what he did was he got out and, and what did he focus on? Unlike 2020, he focused on the swamp. He buried Jeb Bush. And like you, you talked about how, how he would throw all those, you know, bombs at Jeb Bush. Even better on that stage in South Carolina was when people booed him for attacking Jeb Bush. Yep. His response was to say the people in the crowd booing were Jeb's special donors. And those are, those are all Jeb's lobbyists. Okay. Right. Those are all the special interests. I'm here by myself with my son and my wife and that's it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you talk to the average American on the right or the left or the center, they're going to tell you politicians. Yeah. I'm sure politicians are corrupt. That That's not breaking news, but you never heard 
anyone really so brazenly talk about. Yes. <laughs> it, it was just never put out there that way. And a lot of people attacked it and said, oh, well, well, it's just not presidential. But guess what? When you have developed a system for at least 20 to 30 years where you're dumping on the average man and woman in the country, that that pomp and circumstance goes out the fucking window. At some point, they're just like, no, screw it. I want someone to shake this system up because this isn't th – th this is fucking foobar at this point, okay? <laughs> uh, like, you, 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 you can do nothing with this. So, yeah, just come in like a wrecking ball, like a yes. bull in a china shop, and just oh. turn this whole thing on its head. So when he hits them on trade policy, yep. foreign policy, you know, uh, we got to drain the swamp politicians are all talk and no action. That's another one he ran on. And that's, <laughs> all that's why I'm no action. right. And, and I'm going to fund my campaign. Cause if I take money from self funding, else, I'm self funding Charles, by the way. Right. <laughs> I mean that, that stuff oh, was incredible. It was fucking incredible dude. With, with so, so many people. So you've got to take that page out of his book. So mm -hmm. as a libertarian or green party or whoever, Number one, you're going to have to understand there's a little bit of compromise because there's going to be certain areas you're going to get both sides to agree on anyway. Uh, ending the war on drugs, I think, is popular, but where there's probably going to be some middleman would be like in the case of marijuana, maybe even cocaine. If you stopped at those two, I personally think if you created a marijuana market where it could be sold like alcohol today, how many people are still trying to go out and buy that risky moonshine. I mean, there's people who enjoy it. I, I, I drink moonshine some myself, but there's not as big of a market. I'll equivalent that, that really shitty moonshine to like meth and heroin, okay? Because some of that risky moonshine, you know, you go blind and shit like that because they didn't make it properly. There was like a guy in Virginia a few years back got busted because he was cutting it with bleach, oh. okay? So that's the kind of shit, like, I'm going to put meth and heroin on that. Me personally, I feel that if you end the war on, like, marijuana, they say that's the gateway. Well, why would that be the gateway drug? Because you've got such a war on it, and it's so pricey, they then turn to these cheap man-made alternatives that can be made very cheaply, like meth and heroin. If it wasn't so hard to buy this stuff, and it didn't cost so damn much to buy it, why would people try to just turn toward the thing that's poison? You know what right. I mean? It, but, but keeping it outlawed, people are going to try it because it's obviously in the trend. It, 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 the majority of the country wants it legalized. So walk that fine line. There, there's issues you can go you know, bit by bit. For example, on like uh, education being another one. You know, you, If you focus on the fact the public education system is failing us, our foreign wars are sending people to die, costing us all kinds of money, and we're not spending it here at home. And look at the problems we've got laying around, okay? Mm -hmm. you, you focus on this stuff, and you're going to catch the ear of yep. what Trump referred to as the forgotten men and women. Yes, it, it really is. And that, that was a big part of my pitch for Tulsi Gabbard for a year here in New Hampshire. So um, I would part of what I did for her volunteering for her campaign, I would set up events. I would get people to come out and advertise them. Um, and I would introduce her at the event. And one of the things that I would say, I would just say, you know, guys, look, just take Afghanistan on, it, on itself. We're spending a billion dollars a month in Afghanistan. Um, no, no, I'm sorry. Four billion, a billion dollars a week in Afghanistan. That's four billion a month. You do that times 12. That's 48 billion. That's almost 50 billion. I yeah. said, imagine if that 50 billion could, could, we could not spend it there and each state had an extra $50 billion to operate, whether it's block granted from the Fed or it's just 50 billion that we didn't have to raise or, or it, it didn't come out of the pockets of everyday Americans. I said, what could a state of New Hampshire do with an extra billion dollars? Right. Whatever they want to do, whatever they decide to do with it, help with the heroin and opium crisis, help with shortage of affordable housing. Uh, treatment centers, roads. You can do a lot with a billion dollars in a small state of 1.2 million people. Right. So just that right there, man, that's a simple message, but it resonates and it hits home and it cuts across party lines. So absolutely. And I Trump, mean, you're right. Trump did that brilliantly, man. He took those big things and he messaged them almost like you're talking to 
fifth graders. <laughs> right. You know, I'm not casting a wide net and calling all the American people stupid. A lot of people are stupid. A lot of us Americans are really stupid. Um, but that's that's how you have to do it. You, you can't go too deep into the weeds with policy because Trump didn't go into policy. He just said, we're going to get in there. We're going to do this. I'm going to get really smart people around me. And we're going to drain, you know, he talked to America like they were five-year-olds and, and, you know, Ventura did that too, to an extent, because he was a smack talking wrestler out in Minnesota. Right. Right. We're getting screwed by both parties. And I think it's time someone comes in there and cleans house and independent. And, and, and that resonated with people. So we do, we do need, we need something like that. That that's all you really have to say at the end of the day too, just because the average man and woman, doesn't focus on politics, I think, enough to understand all that big talk, I, I guess, is like a, a, a southern way of putting it. You know what I mean? For, for example, you know, I, I've got a mother-in-law. Uh, she. I'm sorry. She. <laughs> <laughs> she. she Just kidding. Happy uh, Mother's she Day to her tomorrow. involved in politics <laughs> yeah. at all. She didn't like listening to it, but eventually, like, she voted for Trump in 16, too. But then she voted for Trump again in 2020, which I told her, I was like, you know, I mean, you, you, you do you. But I mean, yeah. she was just one of those like, oh, my God, we can't have Joe Biden type, type thing. Right. Gotcha. And I, I looked at it and I'm like, look, it, it's it's bowl of shit A versus bowl of shit B. Uh, OK. <laughs> and, and, and me me and another guy, I, I actually, uh, David Spurry, we, we put a thing together. We were just like, you know, look, we. People say there's going to be a red wave, uh, a brown wave. We're voting a uh, libertarian over here. So, you know, if, if, if you add it all together, you know, you, you come out with uh, when you add red and blue, you got purple. When you mix purple and yellow, you got brown. Nice. You add, add a little green in there and that just makes it even worse. So, you know, you got a brown wave 2020. The shit's coming your way. Okay. <laughs> So that's that that that's what we said to everything, and, and it, it it it's coming. But you've got to figure out how to message it better, and that will get over with the working man. You point out what what could states do with a, a billion dollars, like a week, basically, right? Okay, the big thing, one of the big topics on the left is like Flint, Michigan's water. Sure, how quickly could that be fixed? Another thing that a lot of the people on the left have been pushing for, even people on the right, I think, because this could create jobs, would be infrastructure. So a lot of the people who do construction and things like that, mm -hmm. we need our infrastructure upgrade. You know, yeah. I mean, even Bill Maher ran a segment a few weeks back talking about how much uh, infrastructure building China has done. And, oh, and, and, they're eating our lunch, dude. Right. And, and even worse. This just shows how dumb our leaders are. Like I, you, you pointed out, and rightfully so, the reason that they conduct war is to get a hold of materials, minerals, like in Afghanistan, lithium, which, you know, something Ventura pointed out years ago. They got trillions of lithium over there underground. Right. <laughs> right. And, and what, what is lithium being used in, in, in today's batteries, world? Cell phones, batteries, cars. Right, right. Electric and, and cars. With more of a push now by a lot of progressive stuff for electric cars, mm -hmm. good Lord, you're going to need a lot of lithium, right? Shit, yeah. Shit, yeah. So that being said, you know, as uh, General Smedley Butler said, uh, follow the money. You know, war, war, war is war a racket. War is a racket. War is a racket, okay? So if you follow the money, you're going to figure out what's really going on here. But the Chinese have figured out a way to do it way smarter than we ever could. We're trying to get a hold of access to materials, resources, and whatnot through dropping bombs. They've gotten to the point they're not only building their own country's infrastructure. They're buying. But with the Belt Road Initiative, oh, they're building up other countries. They're, they're buying Africa. They own Africa. India. Right. I mean, and, <laughs> and good Lord, I don't know. What, what is one of the biggest things in Africa? that the consumer market buys today, especially if you want to keep your woman happy. <laughs> diamonds. 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 I mean, you think of like the whole blood diamond thing, right? Female, so, female Viagra, diamonds. Right. So l l literally, they're, they're going to be getting access to all this stuff. They, they've laid out their game plan on how they plan to become the number one power in the world. And, and their way of thinking about how they plan to achieve it 
is way ahead of, of any of our old ancient politicians that have been in office since the early 1830s. Yeah. Okay.